Greetings everybody from Melbourne. When I first read the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, I found many tools and methods that helped me understand the suffering that I was experiencing in my early 20s. And when I met Soga Rumshe, I was bereft with the feeling I have nothing more to lose. I was desperately looking for a new means to make sense of my life. Meeting Sogyal at a time of situational vulnerability is just one thing I have in common with the many other women and men who have been abused by him over the years. Another is that we were manipulated with scriptural and hagiographical justifications that primed us to receive and tolerate abuse. I want to share with you some insights into my experience and about how I interacted with Sogyal's young female attendants, whose sexual abuse I only learned of after leaving Rigpa. As I do, I will weave through a few of the scriptural narratives that justified the many kinds of abuse that Sogil committed and the spiritual views that gave us the tools to ignore, to deny, and in some instances, to enable the abuse. There are also the elements that ensured we were kept silent. In my early days, I saw an occasion Sogil publicly humiliate his older students. This didn't sit well alongside the benefit that I was gaining from meditation and contemplation. When Rigpa instructors explained that Sogil's unorthodox behaviour challenges the student's ego, I entertained the notion of it being an opportunity for a retraining of the mind. Rather than judge the teacher, students were taught to look within at their own judgmental mind, to consider they were clinging to a dualistic notion of good and bad. The anthropologist Marion Dabsons has covered this in her considerable research. The Buddha taught that suffering exists, and he also taught that the end of suffering can be realised. The path to the cessation of suffering is the Buddha's teachings, and Sogyal told us he was offering a helicopter ride to the top of the mountain where this path led. His unconventional ways were not the gradual path of other traditions. This swift path relied on devotion and ultimately required the student to invest in seeing the teacher as none other than the Buddha. I speak of this in much more detail in a chapter on pure perception and pure suffering in a forthcoming informed publication. So partially cultivated through the Rigpa culture and partly reasoned through my own need to find a way to free myself of my past experiences, I gradually found myself taking on more and more responsibilities in Rigpa. When I was 29, I moved to Larabling and soon after took ordination as a nun. Once I was at Larabling, I found myself on the receiving end of Sogil's temper. He verbally abused me at first, trialling how I would react, and then he started to physically abuse me. These both increased in severity and frequency over time. A verse from a practice that we recited daily states, Towards the lifestyle and activity of the Lama, that's the teacher, may wrong view not arise for even an instant, and may I see whatever he does as a teaching for me. Through such devotion, may his blessing inspire and fill my mind. A strong spiritual heritage of unconventional training preceded Sogyal. Those who received the wrathful blessing of Sogyal were considered to be very fortunate, as this was viewed as the ripening of our own karma on the path to enlightenment. We would believe Sogyal's crazy wisdom to be clearing obstacles to our path and practice and purifying negative karma. Another view that was widely held, and one that a sexual abuse survivor mentions in the Canadian documentary In the Name of Enlightenment, is the notion that Sogil is clearing blockages in our chakras. We clung to these beliefs so strongly that when Sogil struck us, we aimed to remain open and look into the pain, into the nature of the mind that was perceiving the pain. Though this was evidently abuse, this notion was never entertained. For example, one of Sogil's attendants was struck so forcefully that the on-site medic declared her concussed and insisted that an ambulance be called immediately to attend to the two-inch gash on her scalp. Sogil did not allow this, and he also told everyone involved to keep the event a secret. Secrecy was scripturally edict. Don't tell anyone as they won't understand, was often said by Sogyal, as he would hint at the secret nature of higher training and the fact that his crazy wisdom methods would be wrongly interpreted. This is also what kept me from entertaining my own concerns around the lifestyle of the women that I was working alongside. For many years, I filled a public and ceremonial personal assistant role for Sogyal. In the private sphere, other attendants who weren't nuns would attend to his needs 24 hours a day, dressing, bathing, massaging, cooking, and relaxing with him. We would debrief when reminders or communications needed to traverse his private and his public spheres. When those of us working most closely with Sogil would see one of these women struggling, the story would go around that he's working strongly with her. 
In the time I was at Larabling, there were two women in particular that I was very close with. They often joked with me that looking after Soggy was like caring for an oversized baby, to the extent that they were even required to wipe his bum. They both dealt with the training differently. One would seem to cope incredibly well until she reached breaking point, and then she would bolt and run away. I saw this happen maybe five times. A strategy of coercing her back, caring for her, and rebolstering her sense of self was carefully choreographed and involved her husband amongst others. The other, when Sogil worked strongly with her, was treated by him like an abused dog, degraded, kicked, punched, pulled around the room by her hair, denied care. Each time this happened, her confidence and vibrancy diminished further until she was finally admitted to a psychiatric institution for care. One pattern which I noticed is, is that when the balance amongst Sogil's team of private companions was out of kilter through no fault of their own, is that the physical beatings I received increased. One person described me as being the battered housewife by proxy. It was only after I left Larabling by running away, as I couldn't fathom any other way to protect myself, that I heard of the degrading and violent sexual acts these women were subjected to. I won't share details here, as this is their story to tell, but some can be read in the Lewis Silken Independent Legal Investigation that was commissioned by RIGPA. In the book Fallout by Tale Newland, and in Sex and Violence in Tibetan Buddhism by Mary Finnegan and Rob Hogendorn. The Buddha recommended that his disciples should follow the law of the land where they abide. This was completely ignored by Sogil, but he did call on a number of Buddhist metaphysical alibis from his tradition. One aspect which has ensured that many victims haven't even admitted to the abuse is the threat of hell. It is said that turning against the teacher results in very grave negative karma, and to speak out against him is one of the five heinous crimes. One teacher has sat on a throne at Larabling and declared publicly that I am possessed by a demon, as there is no other explanation for why I would openly speak ill of Sogil, as I am right now, according to such views. But perhaps the aspect that silences the sexual abuse victims more than any other is more personal. Manipulated to see the master not as a human being, but as the Buddha himself, as the source of the highest blessing, means that if one admits to abuse, Sogyal's acts can no longer be interpreted through a spiritual lens. He is dethroned, which retrospectively throws all of the trials one has endured, which for a number of women includes rape, into the realm of very serious crime. This is tantamount to giving up hope, both temporal and spiritual, and an inner fracture can occur which is life-shattering. And then Sogil becomes no different than someone like Jeffrey Epstein, and there are a number of narrative similarities in the way they've abused. Ultimately, I believe that we need to understand that basic human values have been violated profoundly, and that the safety and well-being of the victim needs to be placed ahead of Buddhist rhetoric and the teacher's public image.